On January 28th, 1986, I was working in California, but I was on the afternoon shift, so I didn't have to go to work until later that afternoon. So I went shopping in the morning and came back home. And I turned the television on to the NASA channel. But all I saw was the ocean and the coastline. And I looked at it and said, hmm, okay, that's, that's weird. So I went and took a shower and came back. And the same picture was on there, just the coast and the ocean. So okay, something's up here. So I turned the channel to the PBS channel and I saw the exact same picture. I said, okay, something is wrong. So I turned the channel to the CBS and watched Dan Rather tell us about the Challenger, which had exploded at right after takeoff, and that probably the seven astronauts inside would not survive. So there were many causes and conditions that went into this disaster, and let's, I'm going to take a look at some of them. First off, and a very big one, the launch was supposed to go up on July of 1985, not January of 1986. Now think about this. What's the weather in the Northern Hemisphere in July versus the weather in the Northern Hemisphere in January? Forecast for, that, for the 28th predicted an unusually cold morning with temperatures close to 30 degrees Fahrenheit, the minimum okay. temperature permitted for launch. The shuttle was never certified to operate in temperatures that low. The O-ring, which is the part that failed spectacularly, used in a joint, would not work properly at ambient temperatures below 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and it was 36 degrees Fahrenheit in the morning of the launch. There was no test data to support any expectation of a successful launch in that condition. The launch was scheduled for 9.38 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, but was delayed for two hours to allow ice to melt. Now, an engineer named Bob Everling and Theocal, which was the manufacturer of the O-ring that failed, in October of 1985 wrote a memo. He titled it, Help, so that others would read it. And he, can, he was worried about the lack of concern regarding flow temperatures and the O-ring. Now, there was evidence of serious O-ring present as early as the second space shuttle mis mission, which was flown in 1981. And contrary to NASA regulations, the Marshall Center, which was responsible for the rockets and propulsion systems, did not report this problem to senior management at NASA. They just kept it in the little loop between them and Theocal. Even after the O-ring was designated as a critical one part meaning that the failure would result in the destruction of the orbiter. No one at Marshall suggested that the shuttles would be grounded until the flaw could be fixed. By 1985, with seven of the nine shuttle launches that year using boosters displaying O-ring erosion, Marshall and Theocal realized that they had a potentially serious problem, a potentially catastrophic problem on their hands. Perhaps most concerning was the launch of the STS-51B in April 1985, flown by Challenger, in which the worst O-ring damage to date was discovered in post-flight analysis. They began a process of redesigning the joint. They did not call for the halt of the shuttle flights until the joint could be re redesigned, but rather treated the problem as an acceptable flight risk. Theocal even went so far as to persuade NASA to declare the O-ring problem closed. General Donald Ketchum, a member of the Rogers Commission, which is a commission that looked at, at the shuttle disaster, later likened this situation to an airline permitting one of its planes to continue to fly despite evidence that one of its wings was about to fall off. On January 27th, after the weather forecast of the 28th, NASA personnel remembered the warning and co contacted the company, Theocal. When a manager asked Eberling about the possibility of a launch at 18 degrees Fahrenheit, he answered, we're only qualified 40 degrees. What business does anyone even have thinking about 18 degrees? We're in no man's land. After his team agreed that a launch risk disaster, Theocal immediately called NASA, recommending a postponement until temperatures rose in the afternoon. Theocal management initially supported the engineers' recommendation to postpone the launch, but NASA staff opposed the delay. During the conference call, NASA told Theocal, I'm appalled. I'm appalled by your recommendation. My God, when do you want to launch? Next April? Everling told his wife that night that the Challenger would blow up. 
The temperature on the day of the launch was far lower than had ever been the case with previous launches. It was below freezing at 28 to 29 degrees. Previously, the coldest launch had been 54 degrees Fahrenheit. Although the ICE team had worked through the night removing ice, engineers at Rockwell International, the builders of the shuttle itself, expressed concern. They were watching the pad from the headquarters in California and were horrified when they saw the amount of ice. The head of Rockwell's Space Transportation Division and his colleagues viewed this situation as a launch constraint and told Rockwell's manager at the Cape that Rockwell could not support a launch. Rockwell's manager at the Cape voiced their concern, but they did it in a manner that led the Houston-based mission manager to go ahead with the launch. It was decided to postpone the shuttle launch by an hour to give the ICE team to perform another inspection. After the last inspection, during which the ice appeared to be melting, Challenger was cleared to launch at 11.38 Eastern Standard Time. We all know what happened after that. The shuttle launched, the O-rings failed, the solid rocket booster blew up, the Challenger itself fell apart at 48,000 feet, fell into the Atlantic Ocean, and all seven astronauts were killed. Causes and conditions were, for that catastrophic failure were many and numerous. So we all know the story of the Titanic. It sailed from Cherbourg, France, it hit an iceberg in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, sank, and over 1,550 people were killed. And that was over two-thirds of the people who were aboard. But what if, what if the captain of the ship had taken the ice warnings that he had been given all day long seriously? What if the ship had not been traveling at 22 knots? The ice conditions in the North Atlantic for that April were the worst for any April in the previous 50 years. What if the lookouts in the crow's nest had actually had binoculars? Now understand, there was no moon that night. The sea was totally flat, it was calm, it was like ice is what they said. And when you're looking for an iceberg, what you're looking for is waves at the base of the iceberg. So there was no waves that night. When first Officer Murdoch, who was in charge of the bridge that, at that time, realized he had an iceberg in front of him, he gave two commands. He said, hard starboard, and he told the engineers, full astern. Those two orders doomed the Titanic. If he had only given one order and not the other, it's very possible that the Titanic would have hit the iceberg, but not sunk. And speaking of that iceberg, how is it, and we're talking about the middle of the North Atlantic, this iceberg is directly in front of it. I mean, absolutely perfectly directly in front of you. If it had been 100 yards north or south of it, length of a football field, it had been like two ships passing in the night. No, no disaster. Also, you got the, the SS California, which was 10 miles away, stopped in ice. They saw the rockets from the Titanic. Instead of getting their, watch, their radio watch up, who had just gone to bed 10 minutes before, and saying, why don't you call over there and find out what's going on, they did nothing. And of course, there's the big one. There was not enough lifeboats in there for even a third of the people on board the Titanic. So just think, if, if even one of these causes or conditions hadn't come together, the Titanic would not be as infamous as it is. It'd be about as famous as its sister ships, the Olympic and the Britannic. And the Britannic was going to be called the Gigantic. But after the Titanic incident, they decided to change the name to the Britannic. They didn't want to tempt fate. Go figure. Causes and conditions. So we live and we learn. If you don't learn from the happenings in your life, you're bound to repeat them. That's just common sense. Just like being reborn in samsara over and over again. So what did they learn? The Titanic outcome, they decided, okay, let's put lifeboats on board for everyone. And if, if you go aboard a cruise nowadays, the first thing you do once you pull out is do a lifeboat drill. And you have to attend. No ifs, ands, or buts. And if that ship is not doing one, get off as soon as possible because they're not following the law and they don't care. They set up an international ice patrol to monitor the presence of icebergs in the North Atlantic, and it's still going strong. 
And they decided that, okay, if we got a wireless on board, we're going to keep a watch on it 24 7. Okay? After the Challenger accident, further shuttle flights were suspended for 32 months pending the results of the Rogers Commission investigation. In response to the Commission's recommendation, NASA initiated a total redesign of the Space Shuttle solid rocket boosters. Imagine that. And was watched over by an independent oversight group. NASA also created a new Office of Safety, Reliability, and Quality Assurance, headed by our NASA Associate Administrator, who reported directly to NASA Administrator. Now, the Challenger accident has frequently been used as a case study in the study of subjects such as engineering safety, the ethics of whistleblowing, communications, group decision making, and the dangers of groupthink. It's part of the required reading for engineers seeking a professional license in Canada and other countries. What does this have to do with the Dormer? Causes and conditions. Just look about you. Your place in the universe right now is a direct result of causes and conditions, most of which you have created due, in, due to karma ripening from your previous actions. Now, some people can consider their lives a tragedy. And actually, if you think about it, samsara is a tragedy because you're going to be reborn and you don't know where until you create the causes and conditions be, to get the realizations to become awakened for the sake of all sentient beings. The Buddha, by giving us the Dharma, has shown us how, by being born in this lifetime, we have created an opportunity to create the causes and conditions for having either a happily ever after or instead, instead of a tra tragedy. So the question becomes, what causes and conditions are you working on right now?